Hi, I'm David Hester, and welcome back to the alt Pubach Club approach number one to interpreting primary source and early manuscripts for Pibrach. The previous video, I mentioned rule number one of five rules, possibly six, but of five rules that I use to help understand and get at the music behind the scores when I read these primary sources. And the first rule is get back to the primary sources. They will teach you things that the secondary and derivative sources won't. And what they teach you will inform you how to play better when you come and decide that you are going to stick with the Pibrock Society derivative scores and play it in a modern style. That's neither here nor there to me. But getting back to the primary scores will teach you something about the music behind the notes on the page and make you a better and more informed performer. What's the second rule? Today we're going to have the second rule, and the second rule is genres are distinctive. Now, I've written about this before. Um, we think of bagpipes in the in the following genre care bagpipe music in the following genre categories. All right, there is um, marches, stress bass, reels, hornpipes, jigs, slow airs, and pibroch. Right? These are genres. The interesting thing is then we also talk about light music and the big music. And under the light music classification, we talk and mention march, stress bass, reels, slow airs, um, hornpipes, and jigs. But when we talk about the big music, we just say pibroch. No. Pibroch is not a genre. It's not all one big mess. It is, in fact, comprised of several different genres, and Pibroch is the classification. Pibroch just means playing, piping. Kill more is the big music. When I am asked, hey, David, what are you doing to bagpipes? and I worry about how to explain what pibroch is to somebody who has no clue about bagpiping at all, I say, well, you've encountered bagpiping in areas such as marches and parades. Maybe you've gone to a Highland Games, and what you see is that people like to march around or people like to dance to it. That's what the light music is for, entertainment of that sort, or what have you. Pibroch was the class of music that was performed at all of the other social settings of everyday life. It was performed for as saluting a dignitary of a militia call for the gathering of the troops on the battlefield and for stirring them up to battle. It was played for remembrances of key historical events in the clan, whether positively, where they would taunt the losers over whom they were victorious, or negatively and sadly, where they would reflect on a great loss or tragedy. It was played for funerary remembrances. It was played for celebrations of birth. It was also played for mundane tasks. For example, rowing. Rowing across a lake, even rowing across the high seas. Pibroch was the music that was used for everyday life or, if not everyday life, for occasions that weren't about dancing, and the quick step didn't happen until much later. So, we have commonplace concepts of what the right response is to a given circumstance. We have that. And 
that's something that we as musicians are aware of as well. We know playing sad music is right for sad occasions and playing happy music is right for happy occasions. We just instinctively know this. We can imagine circumstances where joyful music might come through after a time of mourning to bring the crowd into a better space, but it's not the first thing that you would think of when you attend a funeral, right? Pibra had to be appropriate for social occasions and as such had to be played distinctively. These tunes didn't all sound the same. They weren't all slow, weren't all necessarily dignified, weren't drudging, they weren't all laments. When you approach a tune, sometimes the titles might give you an idea. Some titles we have no idea of, and there are some tunes that have three and four titles that are unrelated altogether. But you get better at recognizing that this is a rowing tune because it has 17 variations on it. Or you see, no, this is a lament. How was a lament played? And you'll see interesting indicators like andante. Hmm, andante, time for laments. Okay, at least one lament I know of has that. You will see other things like military gathering calls, right? The great bridge, call, end of the great bridge, end of the little bridge. You see these and you know that on the military field, nobody's going to listen to you play a slow dirge and know what to do. Genres were, dis were distinctive and you as a performer should imagine what the appropriate style for a tune may be once you come to an idea of what that genre could be. Truth be told, we haven't done much by way of genre studies. We're looking into it, um, doing comparisons and trying to identify key indicators for what marks um, what would have been intuitively um, understood as a marker for a salute versus um, a lament. We're working on that. But for the most part, many of your instructors would be able to tell you, yeah, this is a lament. Yes, this is a gathering tune. Yes, this is a salute. How you choose to interpret it from there depends on what you would imagine a group of people at the time might have expected. We may or may not be able to know this more. Key Sangers and Hugh Cheat might be. Ian McKinnis as well might be able to help us here. But for the most part, William Donaldson has very clear, clearly stated all P. Brock was played about 30% past, or that is now. And we can imagine um, if you needed to gather troops that that one particular P. Brock probably was played a lot more quickly than if you wanted to mourn the dead. Don't be afraid to experiment with tempos. And these primary sources, some of them will actually give you tempos that are quite surprising. Hence, rules number one and two are very valuable in allowing us to read, respect, and learn from these earlier sources and bring to us some interpretive options and possibilities that we haven't really explored much in the last 50 to 100 years. Okay, that's lesson number two or rule number two. See you at the next one.